I can't say every healing is going to happen. I can say it doesn't matter if you're broken or wounded or torn to pieces or if you're emotionally low. God can use you even then to do things beyond your imagination. Hey everybody, welcome to Perpetual Motion, a podcast focused on self-care, financial independence, and better communication for more positive relationships. I'm your host, Mo Anderson. My guest today is Dr. David Chatka, who goes by Dr. David. He is the co-author of the book, Healing Prayer. He is also a speaker, prayer mobilizer, and the founder and director of Spirit Equip Ministries in Canada. He has four earned degrees. And if you don't know what that means, that means they are not honorary degrees. He did the work (laughs) with three in theology and spirituality. And he serves as an adjunct instructor in the Pathway School for Ministry. His CV is long and impressive. I'll stop there because we've got some questions to ask this man of faith. Today, we're talking about vertical relationships, the power of prayer, and the importance of faith in God. Welcome, Dr. David. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. You actually pronounced my last name correctly, so I'll give you kudos for that. <laughs> hey, hey, we're, we're off to a good start then. You know, we, yeah. we've discussed that. I'm, I'm Monica, and people say Monica, so I, I'm really big on uh Correct pronunciation of the okay, so name. You're Dr. Mo and I'm Dr. David, so they were good. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. Hey, we're going to start with your personal journey. You shared with me that years ago you had a, an experience with a bully that changed your prayer life. Can you share that story? Yeah, I, you know I haven't used the word bully because he did change. But uh, what happened was I was a I was a stu- student in seminary, and the seminary was a mixed thing. There were some some really wonderful people who believed one thing, and there's wonderful people who believed other things. <laughs> I don't have to go a great length about it. But there, there were really two camps. There was the supernaturalist camp that believed in God's miraculous intervention, and there was the group that said, science has taught us this just isn't so. I do think that's a false dichotomy, but listen, regardless of that, I was just getting started. Mm-hmm. And uh, as I was um, going to this class, of course, there's a, there's a cohort, and we're together for three of our five classes, and there's two electives. So I go to one of these classes and one of the profs gets up and says something about the Bible not being true. And in the class, there was this guy and he was hilarious. <laughs> he had this, he could look at you sideways and make the room laugh. That's what he, he and he was a, he was a radio commentator who had started to go into the ministry and he, he was used to talk radio where people would throw something at him and he'd make a joke and that kind of thing. Anyway, mm-hmm. so I said something defending the scripture and this guy stands up in the class. And he lobs the humor grenade into the middle of the room. And the next thing you know, the room explodes in laughter. But I was the object of the laughter. Mm, and I thought, okay. oh, you know what? That's one. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> so the next class, it happened again. I said something defending the faith. And he, he threw the grenade in the middle of the room and it exploded with laughter. And I was once again the object. Oh, no. And this, this went on uh, for every class that I was with him in. And so after, after a while, you just say to yourself, uh, we're not going to be friends. <laughs> I understand, and, and I'm guessing he wasn't doing it to anyone else. Just you? No, nope, no. Nope. It was just this unbelief thing, on, and I think it was because I was so vocal about my faith and, and others. Mm, were, that happens, uh, yeah. At any rate, what happened was, uh, in the course of time, I just, I just kept my guard up whenever I was around this guy. But he had mm-hmm. a lovely, sweet wife, and he had, we had a mutual friend, and I called her Susie in the book. She's a gentle, sweet, other-centered, do unto others you'd have them do unto you kind of girl. Anyway, one day I was walking across the plaza to get to my class. And I meet this girl, Susie, and I said, hey, Sue, how you doing? And she said, I'm fine. How about you? She said, well, I'm good. You see that hospital six blocks down the road? I said, Mm -hmm. you know, the comedian in the class. I said, yeah, I know him very well. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know him very well, but anyway, she said, he's in the hospital. And Dr. Bo, I didn't feel bad. (laughs) I I I, I don't feel bad even just hearing the story. So I know you did. I had to repent of my stinking bad attitude because Jesus loves us all. Anyway, getting back to this, Mm -hmm. I got to this spot where I realized so here's what happened she said well it's a serious thing he's in the hospital he's got something called phlebitis now for your listeners Mm. you probably know uh, it's a clot in your vein and if it's they call it an embolism i think is the proper name for it but if the clot breaks free it'll travel through your bloodstream and if it gets to your lung or your brain 95 times out of 100 it kills you and if it doesn't kill you you're impaired phlebitis it's terrible yeah yeah or your heart yeah that's very dangerous anyway the point Mm -hmm. was it's serious 
And, you know, at that point in the game, I was trying to keep my guard up around this guy. And I thought, oh, I'll listen. So I turned to the girl and I say, Susan, I'm glad he's getting good care. Is he getting good care? She said, yes. And then she said this crazy thing. She said, um, he asked me to ask you something. I said, oh, what's that? And she said, he wants you to come and pray for his healing. I said, what? <laughs> of all people, right? What, wow. What like crazy thing is this? So, so she said, yeah, he, he wants you to pray for his healing. I said, I'm not going. Now, there were mm. three reasons for not going. Okay. One, I was, te- I was really fed up with all the mind. You know, I was done with that. I right, know. right. Number two, I'd never met anybody who'd been healed by what the Bible calls the prayer of faith. And number three, I'd not received any training. So I didn't know what to do or how to do it, and I'd mm-hmm. not seen it. I didn't meet anybody who had received this gift. I just never had seen it. The only thing I saw was the crazies on television screaming and slapping people on the forehead while they fell down as they threw hands. Yeah, I'm pushing them over. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> I didn't think that was a helpful model. Anyway, <laughs> getting, getting back to this. So she says, he, I said, I'm not going. And he's been cruel. And she said, he has been cruel. Now, this is a really, really sweet kind girl. And for her to say that of anyone else was, was a huge admission. So mm. she said, I will go talk to him. I said, very good. I'm not going. So I went up with him into my class. The next day, I see the girl in the coffee lounge. Hey, Susan, how you doing? She said, oh, I'm fine. How about you, David? I said, I'm, I'm doing well. And she said, well, I talked to our friend. And he has told us that he told me that he's really sorry he did that to you and he wants you to come pray. I said, oh, I'm not going. <laughs> Second time. <laughs> anyway, third time, I'm cross- crossing the same plaza. I had a repeater class. And she sees me in that, in that plaza. She walks up to me and she said, Hey, man, how you doing? I said, Susan, I'm fine. How about you? She said, I'm good. Did you go and see her friend? I said, I'm not going. Mm-hmm. Now, here's what happened. I don't know if you've ever been told off by your mother. But this girl suddenly got what I call the righteous indignation look. She just got firm. She was a gentle, sweet, kind girl. And for her to talk that way, I'd never heard her talk this way to anybody else. She stomped her foot in the pavement. She raised her voice and she spoke my name and put my middle initial in there. And she said, David R. Chuck, aren't you going around this school telling everybody the Bible is the word of God and it's supposed to be obeyed? I said, yes. She said, well, what about this scripture? I was sick. And you visited me. And suddenly I realized, oh, mm. no. <laughs> but I have to go and see the guy, the bully. I got to go see the guy, the mocker. And I looked at her and said, well, it just, it said, now I was still scared because I didn't know what I was doing. So I said, well, it says sick and prayed, not sick and prayed. Sick, sick and visited. No, no. And she said, doesn't matter. Sick and visited, sick and prayed. You got to go. Right. Said, right. Well, okay. So I did my class. And after the class, I walked the six blocks. It was the university campus, the university hospital. So I walk in. And I walk in the room and he's in a bad way. I mean, he's very pale and it's obviously, he's obviously in distress. He's hooked up to monitors and he, there's, a, there's mm. an intravenous thing going into his system. Nurses are walking in and up with clipboards and medications. And so I, I bet he I, was surprised to see you, even I, though well, he'd asked for you. You know what? I, I, I talked to him about the weather. <laughs> said, oh, yes, the nice weather we're having. Then mm-hmm. I talked to him about his books. Uh, what he was studying, and we talked, and I said, oh, look, I'm, uh, you're getting good care. I'm thankful you're getting good care. I'll go right. now. And he looked at me, and he said, wait, aren't you, aren't you going to pray? And I said, oh, just a minute, before I do anything like that. I remember I'm, I'm terrified because I don't know what I'm doing. I'm greener than your average greenhorn. <laughs> so, but, but I was terrified of the, of the mockery. I said, every single time I have said anything about the Bible being true, about the historicity of Jesus' miracles, about the resurrection, about the cross, anything. You have come after me, and you have made me a mockery to our peers. Why, in the name of all that is holy, are you asking me to pray for your healing? And the man burst into tears. He was like 27 years old, and he just cried, wept buckets. And then he said, I am so sorry I did that to you. I'm so sorry. But I have phlebitis, and I could die. And it's serious. They just ran tests yesterday. The, the clot is not diminishing. It's serious. Won't you please pray that your God heal? And what are you going to do? I mean, I looked at him and I, you know, I didn't watch, <laughs> but suddenly I realized mm-hmm. he was serious. He wasn't going to mock me. I still was kind of afraid of that because once bitten, twice shy, you know, but I, then I, remember, sure. I still know what to do. So you pray for well, him, Jesus, I hope. You know, yeah, well, Jesus put his hand on people. So I said, okay, I could do that. So, so I said, hey, mm-hmm. can I put my hand up over the spot? He said, yeah. I said, where's this body? He said, left arm over above the elbow. I said, okay. So I went around to his bedside, put one hand there, put the other hand on his head. And this was the defining moment that changed my life. 
I had never done this before. I had never met anybody heal before. And I start, I, I prayed something. I don't remember what I prayed. <laughs> what I remember is that it was an honest prayer. Mm-hmm. I was terrified for lots of reasons. One was the mockery. One was lack of experience. And three, I didn't even know if it belonged to this age, if we're supposed to do this kind of thing. I knew that this guy uh, really did want the prayer. So I started to pray. And then suddenly the atmosphere in the room was fundamentally transformed. It was like the whole room was filled with uh, fiery compassion and mm-hmm. liquid love. I mean, it was just, it was in the air. And then I started to inhale that, you know, and then my whole being filled up with fiery peace. And I had focus. I've tried to describe this. The best way I can describe this is that it was like suddenly I was zoned in on this man. Mm-hmm. He was the object of God's compassion and the compassion was rising inside of me. And I, and mm-hmm. then this fiery heat filled my whole being up and it flowed down my hand and went into his arm. And then he said, what is that fiery heat? Wow. He felt it through your hand. I said, that's the spirit of Jesus. He's healing you. And then I ran out of the room. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I had never felt anything like that before. I didn't know what it was. And the next day, in the school, he's back. I said, you're here. He said, I am. And I I said, what happened? And he pulled me into a corner. He looks in every direction. And then he says, that prayer changed my life. And then I ran away again. (laughs) That is awesome. The next class, he stood up and defended my faith with his humor. And he did that all term. And then at the end of the term, we had to go to a summer field. We had to, we had the assignments. We had to go under the tutelage of an, a pastor in a church, right? So he mm-hmm. passes me a phone number and he says, if you're in trouble, you call me. And I said, oh, oh sure. That's fine. <laughs> so that's, I went that off is the amazing. Field. I, I yeah, got okay, to get to I the next to the story because it's important. So we get oh, back. Okay. We get back. He, he, I hadn't called him. He said, why haven't you called? I said, I had no trouble. And two months later, we're going to park. And we're talking to each other. And there's his wife. There's him. And there's this girl, Susan. And they look at me and we're talking small talk. And then suddenly the next thing you know, they're giving him the elbow and they said, tell David what happened. Tell Chaka what happened. You got to tell him. Mm-hmm. He said, I don't want to tell him what happened. <laughs> so anyway, eventually, here's what the story was. I left a nurse walk and the nurse, he said to the nurse, I could go home now. Jesus has healed me. My friend from the Bible school, he came and prayed for me. And she said, we don't do that around here. <laughs> you have to have tests. And so he said, run the test. And she come to get him because it was due for them. So. He was down the hall getting the test done. And the test came back. Every trace of phlebitis was gone from his body. And the clown wow. didn't big the day before. Is this this was not important. What a miracle. Well then here's the rest of the story. So so he went home and that night he and his wife were thankful, of course. He, his wife mm-hmm. picked him up. He'd never seen anything like this before. By the way, I hadn't either, but regardless. He he and his wife knelt beside their bed. They thanked God for the for this amazing gift. They went to sleep. And he had a dream. And in the dream, he heard a voice. And the voice said, my servant David defends the integrity of my word when he speaks. Hmm. And he did right through the end of Bible school. And, you know, it was just this amazing. And 30 years, 30 years later, he sent me an email. We lost, I changed the nomination. But uh, he said, he, we lost touch because we weren't in the same stream. But he sent me a note 30 years, just about to retire. He said, 30 years ago. My arm was healed of phlebitis. I have three kids. I am thankful. The Lord saved my life. Thank you, David John. That's what he said. Wow. That's quite a story. Very amazing. And uh, such a testimony to the power of prayer and faith. Even when you're on shaky ground, that yeah, I you know, I know still, cool. still went forward. But I want to I wanna explore that a little bit. And sure. uh, so I got a few more questions around that. Uh, in that instance, you got a yes to that prayer. And, and I love the way you shared it because so many of us are unsure. You know, it's one thing to read it and to be at home in our prayer rooms. But then when somebody actually calls you to, you know, demonstrate that faith, that prayer, it's, you know, it can be unnerving. Yes. And you got a, a yes that time. Yeah. But every person of faith at some point has wondered, why does God say no? Well, you know what? There's the book describes five pathways to healing. Mm-hmm. And uh, the last chapter, so of course we go through the whole book as a 200 page book. And at the end of the book, there's a short five page chapter that's a summary of uh, what we believe. So there, there is this thing called the instant heal. And I have seen enough of that to know that it's supposed to be far more frequent than it really is right now. 
I also hmm. talk about natural healing. My wife was cured of muscular dystrophy, and before she was, now that's, by the way, that's the reason in the book, too. Before hmm. she was, if she damaged muscle tissue, she'd lose the muscle. After she was healed, the muscles grew. Wow. So I regard natural, ordinary, like when you cut your finger and you wash it, put a bandage on it, it heals by itself. That's miracle too. Yeah, the third yeah one absolutely. Is, yeah, the third one is what I call a pathway to a remedy. And I t- we tell stories of different people who were guided to medical work. And you know this. You're, you're, a, you're a dentist. You know this. You studied for years to get this right. You studied for years about how to help people. And it might be because you saw somebody suffer some way and you wanted, you're motivated to try and fix this. Maybe you felt guided by God to do this. Right now as we speak, there are people who are doing research because some catastrophic event happened to their sister or their uncle or their brother. Mm-hmm. And what they want to do is to find a cure. And they give, they give their life and they're praying to God for the guidance to come. Listen, if, if you get the cure after 30 years of their research, take the cure. It's God. <laughs> so that's the third one. The fourth one is this thing called holy mystery, where we bear with suffering and we don't know why. And there are seasons where that simply happens. And God doesn't tell us, and we're not to know for whatever reason. And then finally, we have the miraculous cross, where it's our time on earth is done, and it's time for us to go home to be with God. And then all five of these things overlap and interrelate to each other, all five of those pathways. And so there's this, I, I have personally experienced seasons where I'm guided to a pathway to a remedy. The remedy reaches its logical conclusion. The medicine runs out. The next thing you know, you're granted a miraculous act of power or an instant healing or the ability to be able to endure in the middle of whatever it is. And every life in, in the gospel, every person in the gospel experienced the same. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not like there's all, and, and actually each of the healing stories in the Bible is very different from each other. So the 10 lepers in the gospel of Luke, they have leprosy. They yell at Jesus across the distance and he says, Oh, by the way, boys, walk toward the priest. <laughs> and so they start walking and they get healed as they walk. You have the leper in Mark one who comes toward Jesus and he asks that Jesus touch him and he does and the, the heal is instant. You have the story of Naaman the Syrian, who he was full of pride, and he comes with his money, his bags of money, and his bags of clothes, mm-hmm. and an army retinue, and he wants international service. Thank you very much. And he gets a servant boy with a stick, <laughs> telling him to take a bath in the river. <laughs> so he, he dips, he dips seven times in the river, and it's not till number seven that the healing. Well, but in, in the other part of that story that I like is that he didn't want to do it at first. He was insulted that Absolutely, Jesus yes. didn't do some big amazing miraculous thing and yeah, he so the, and the servant was story. like you know <laughs> <laughs> the servant was like well if he asked you to slay a dragon you would have done that yeah, but exactly or kill, he gave you this simple assignment <laughs> you don't want to do right so yeah that there's a lesson right there is that, you know sometimes we're looking for these big amazing things and the answer so, is is much more simple yeah get back to so my wife was afflicted with muscular dystrophy and her sister is still a do muscular dystrophy, and her niece, and her mom was. Mom's in heaven now. Anyway, when I married her, I knew that I was going to have to push a wheelchair barring a mirror. End of our days, but hey, first girl to laugh at my jokes. <laughs> she just accepted me. I accepted her, and it was the smart meant to be. <laughs> yeah, it's just it. So, you know, uh, when she, I have to say this to you, 20, 25 years, I don't know how long we prayed. I think, I think I calculated, I think it was 22 years when I first met her and she was afflicted with this declining health. She couldn't raise her arms above her shoulders. She, if she damaged the muscle, she'd lose it. Her face was sagging and so on. Yeah, we're bonded in a marvelous way, but we started praying about that when we were just friends. Mm-hmm. And then in the course of time, we became spiritual friends, then we became buddies, and then we became people who fell in love and we married and so on. But I mean, we, we were praying that prayer for a long, long, long time. And here was the irony. While she was declining from the effects of muscular dystrophy, she would pray with people who had medical issues and the people would be healed while she was declining. And there was this thing with this overlapping ages thing. You're already participating in the powers of the next age. You're not yet as you should be. And we live between those two realms. And we, we, we had that in front of us all the time mm-hmm. because she, there was one time where she prayed with a lady whose eyeball had been punctured by a tack coming out of the wall. And as she prayed, the fire of the Lord landed on her. The girl with the, the injured eye was completely restored, and she continued to decline with muscular dystrophy. Mm-hmm. And so, so actually, I'll give you some Bible for this. If you go to the book of Galatians, and you look at why Paul was telling off the Bible, he's kicked off at the Galatian church. He's just so right. mad at it. He doesn't even thank God that they're Christians. <laughs> it's the only letter in the New Testament where there's no thanksgiving, because mm-hmm. they've thrown out the Spirit. Anyway, so... He says in chapter three, 
Did the God who did signs and wonders among you do it by faith and hearing or by works of the law? And so he, this little mad thing that he says makes it clear that miraculous acts of power happened when Paul was in Galatia. And then in the fourth chapter, he says, don't you remember? I was so sick and you cared for me. And that's why I preached the gospel. Mm -hmm. Now, he, put those two things together. He gets sick. He falls onto the care of strangers. And while the strangers are caring for him and he's getting better slowly, healing naturally, he prays for someone and they get well instantly. <laughs> so then he starts talking about the Jesus he loves. And while they're caring for his physical health, mm -hmm. he starts doing miraculous acts of power. And the two things overlap in Paul the Apostle. And so I can't say every healing is going to happen. I can say it doesn't matter if you're broken or wounded or torn to pieces or if you're emotionally low. God can use you even then to do things beyond your imagination. So okay. my wife, we prayed for, and then we stopped praying for him. We just gave up. We just figured, you know what? This is obviously not going to happen. We didn't say this is not the will. We just said it's not for whatever reason, it's not happening. Mm -hmm. And then my church decided to serve the poor in Uganda. And so we sent teams of people there to help train the pastors who've been in that war zone for 20 years under that awful warlord, Joseph Bacconi, and under Edi Amin. And that whole area, nobody had an education for 20 years. If you could read, you became the town hour, you know. Mm -hmm. If you could read, you became the one who taught the little kids how to do their ABCs. But it was pathetic. There was, they hadn't had opportunity to do anything. It had been robbed away by these two horrible men. So my church was going there to help them rebuild. I would do evangelism and training with the pastors. And then uh, we would bring build teams and they would create infrastructure. We built a library. We built a latrine. We did those kinds of things for them. So anyway, that bishop from that church, uh, from, from that gathering, we, we trained a thousand pastors. There was an organizer. And he was a bishop. And he came to my church to preach because my church wanted to find out. And while he's preaching, he's standing at the front. And the church, by the way, is packed. We had three services on a weekend. The sanctuary mm -hmm. is designed to hold 450. And the Saturday nighters was the smallest crowd. But they heard this guy telling amazing stories. And they texted their friends and said, we're going to go to the nine o'clock tomorrow morning. So all the Saturday nighters came to nine o'clock. And the nine o'clockers were so amazed by this with the oversized crowd. They all came to the 11, which was usually our biggest service. But now we had the Saturday nighters, the nine fifteeners, and now we had the 11 o'clock. And it was just jammed to the raptures. I am sitting on the step looking because <laughs> the place was full. My wife was two rows from the front. Remember, she hadn't been able to raise her arms above her head for more than oh, decades. Right. And the, the guy's preaching. He stops and looks at me and he says, David, what is M.A.? I said, M.A.? Master of Arts? I don't know. <laughs> he said, no, I got something wrong. He put his head on the pulpit and he waited. Now, he was in the middle of a story that everybody wanted to hear. And he got this interrupted thing. And then he looks at me and he says, it's a wasting muscle. It starts in your head, it goes down in your face, it causes your face to say. Your shoulder your is going to position. Okay. He describes FSH muscular dystrophy like he's reading it out of, a, out of the Mayo Clinic textbook. It's just this amazing thing. And then he said this, whoever has this, Jesus has just healed you. Now I was looking at my wife because I was realizing what was going on. Mm -hmm. Her arms went above her head for the first time in decades. Mm -hmm. And then she went home with me because we had guests who were thinking about traveling to Uganda to do work projects. And while we're home, the plan was that I would get up on the top shelf and take down the heavy pots and pans that we don't ordinarily use, use them just for comfort. She pushes me aside. She stands up. She gets the heavy pots and pans, puts them down. And a week later, when we were disciplining our daughter, she ran up the stairs for the first time in more than 20 years. Oh, that had to be amazing to experience. Oh, there were 650 witnesses to that miraculous act of power. Our doctor had known us for five years. He was treating her for the effects of the pain management stuff because there is no cure for muscular dystrophy at this point. In fact, the guy who founded Lululemon, he's got the same thing, FSH muscular dystrophy. Hmm. He's just donated hundred million bucks for medical research on that key, that, that, that theme. So you guys can look at this if you're in the United States. It's, it's, it's the story. Anyway, it was just this incredible kind of a thing. She's, she's well, and it's just, you have to know something for years, for decades. We had prayed for an intervention and we were led in a pathway to a remedy. The remedy did not succeed in alleviating anything other than symptomatic pain. And then when we gave up, we decided that we would use this phrase, and this is an important phrase in this book, 
you don't seek the healing. You seek the healer. Mm. Wow. And we made the decision to take our declining powers and use the best that we had to serve the one that we love, knowing full well God could heal or not as he chose. And the phrase I use in the book is God initiates and we respond, not we initiate and God responds. Right, God right. That's, that's, that's yeah. very good. That's, that's very good and it's inspiring to hear. The next question that I have for you was actually uh, posed to me by a friend earlier this week. I was talking about this uh, upcoming episode and that I was excited to be sharing with you and, and interviewing you and talking about your book. And this is not just this person, but a lot of people now uh, do not believe. They believe in heaven, but they don't believe in hell. So the question is, is hell a literal place and are there demons in this world? Well, you know what? I don't like the doctrine, but when the day is done, I don't want to see Hitler and Mussolini or even Vladimir Putin in heaven. Mm. Um, I do believe there is a reward and some people simply don't want nothing to do with God and hate him. And so I personally think that God doesn't send us to hell, we choose it. Oh. But there is, there, and I, I actually, my very first experience, my uh, now you, what you've done is you put me in this place where I have to tell you the startup story. The way that I became a Christian, I could not say Jesus' name. I simply was unable to do that. Mm -hmm. I would get angry if people talked about the blood. And I was surrounded by people who had just become believers. They invited me to a meeting where there was an English Methodist, and the guy was about five foot three, sweat profusely, spoke with a lovely accent, rubbed his hands together, and his glasses would come down. Him. He'd look at you and he'd say, glory, hallelujah. Have you got Jesus in your flesh? <laughs> <laughs> That's how he preached. Sounds so, like Bishop T.D. Jakes, actually. Oh, 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 <laughs> with an English accent. <laughs> so, at any rate, he... He asked people if they wanted, if anybody wanted to receive Jesus in your flesh, come forward. I, I and I was, I had this, the war going inside my spirit. I was, I was intrigued by the man, but appalled by what he was saying. And I found myself at the front. Then he looked down at me. He said, "No, no, not now. When I finish me sermon," he said. <laughs> so I was standing at the front. Eventually, I knelt down, and fifteen people came forward, and I knew most of them because it mm -hmm. was mostly from my high school. I knew most, of them. and I he he goes to the first girl that he's praying. And he looks at her, and I knew her background, and she was a broken girl. She was sad, and she was, you know, just broken. And he looks at her, and he says, I want you to tell Jesus you love him. And she tried. But it just wasn't. Oh, she was broken. He said, no, you don't mean it. Let me pray for you. And this this happened to me when I was just at this moment of trying to figure out if I, that I wanted to be a Christ woman. I looked over at her. His hands were shining. And this beautiful light came inside of her. She cried and cried beautiful tears. And then she told Jesus she loved her. That was lovely. He went to the girl next to her. I knew her too. Same thing happened. Came to me last. Week. Now remember, I've been unable to say Jesus' name. And I got mad at the black. Mm -hmm. He pointed his finger in my belly and he said, get out. Said, get out? What are you talking about? I looked down. His hand was shining and around the center of my being. There was an inky, cloudy black mass. And he said, out of that young man, out in Jesus' name, out you go, out you go. And his finger got higher and higher. As I watched this finger and this black cloud come to my chin, and then this black thing flew out of my mouth, and then I was surrounded by a magnificent vision of glorious light that was bright as the sun. And then the light came inside of me. Wow. And then I could say Jesus' name. Yes, there are demons. And yes. Jesus is stronger. And Matthew's gospel says that hell was not made for humans. It was made for the devil and his angels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what it says in Matthew 25. Now you want to join him? God gives you the opportunity. You want to be with Jesus? He also gives you the opportunity. So my answer is to tell you the story and to say, yes, I do believe that there is a judgment day. Yes, I do believe there is a heaven. Yes, I do believe there is a hell. And I have had to deal with powers of darkness. In fact, I'm writing another book. And my wife said to me, look, David, don't write about demons. I said, why not? She said, because crazy people will think you're sane. Sane people will think you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I like your wife. I haven't met her, but I can tell we get along famously. You know, anyway, so what, but here's what happened. The church I'm in, by the way, it's a delightful church, and it is completely multiracial. It is so the two best worship leaders, uh, one's, one's uh, a person descended from African slave stock, one's an immigrant from Jamaica. 
there are Asians and there are blacks and there are whites mm-hmm. and there are mixed race marriages and who cares? Nobody cares. Anyway, the church that I'm in asked me to do a Bible study. I said, what's it on? They said, dealing with the powers of darkness. <laughs> so I had to write the Bible study and they, I taught it to a class there. And so I have a startup manuscript that needs improvement, but I am going to write on this in the time to come. So whether you like it or not, Jesus mm-hmm. believed in the demon. If you don't believe that Jesus believed in the demons, you have to take two thirds of the gospel of Mark out. You have to rewrite the gospel. In fact, what I got, so very first experience of Jesus was to receive the power of the spirit so that he could take back our human domain from the powers of darkness. The mm-hmm. second experience was being thrown into a confrontation with Satan himself for 40 consecutive days and nights. And he had to defeat him physically, mentally, emotionally, and then spiritually. And those are the three temptations. In mm-hmm. fact, I don't know if you ever thought about it. I'm a Star Trek fan, so live long and proud. So there was no transporter being back in the day. Not, there was not. The devil picks Jesus up and puts him on the pointy part, the pinnacle of the temple. And there was no transporter beam and there was no elevator or escalator or other ladder. Mm-hmm. And there he tempts him to commit. To you know, go for a high so the angel would catch him. Then he transports him to a high mountain. We're talking sixty miles. And I mean, this this people go to amusement parks and pay money so they can cheat. <laughs> so, they'll give you a hunt. Put me in the thing so it slides down fast and stops just before I get killed. Uh, but you know, you trust the guy who you pay the money to, or you don't go on the ride. Mm-hmm. Jesus was carried by Satan to the mountain top. I would not want to pay any money for that ride. He was also shown all the kings of the world and all their glory in a passing second. It's not metaphorical language. It's very clear that in the mind of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that temptation was real. Mm-hmm. And so the enemy has this power to be able to tempt him and show him all this stuff. And then Jesus defeats him. And then he starts his ministry. And the first thing that happens in Mark's gospel is he calls the four guys, the four fishermen. The second thing is he goes to the synagogue in Pergamum starts to preach, and a man screams, I know who you are, you're the son of God, and the guy's demonized, he hits the ground, Mm -hmm. he cries out, Jesus casts out the unclean spirit, then that night, he goes to Peter's home, heals Peter's mother-in-law, and then the entire town gathers, and he casts out demon appeals the same. Now, that's either true or it's not. That If you look at the two-spirit contrast in Mark's gospel, it permeates, it saturates the book, and if you don't say yes to that, you throw the gospel out. Mm -hmm. Wow. That makes sense? Makes a lot of sense. Actually, right now I'm writing a little commentary on Mark. I'm calling it Mark, comma, my word. <laughs> <laughs> you and, are clever. You well, are clever. I, I was stunned. That. So I put, as I do my words, I did a little study at the end and said, those are my words. What are yours? And I, I start to write this little thing about people asking questions. But I, mean, I, I was appalled, astonished, amazed at how thoroughly pervasive the two spirit contrast is in Mark's God. Every look, and the book of Ephesians is all about that, and so is Colossians. I look forward to that. Uh, Mark, my words. Let me get <laughs> let me get one more question here. We're running out of time before sure. we uh fin- wrap up and talk about your book a little bit. This, sure. this is one that I hear a lot uh, within my friend group and also online. Uh, first Corinthians 10 13 says, in part, uh, God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, and yep. you just talked about temptation and when you are tempted he will give you a way out a way of escape is old king james yes way to escape how do you recognize this way out when you're in the moment and the flesh oh, listen, is weak? i wrote a whole book on that okay so <laughs> just, yeah, just give us the answer please I'll, Dr. I'll David. The book, here's, here's the book it's hey are you there it's me god how to listen to some uh, and I'll okay, give you short- and we'll tell people how to connect with that, but i like for folks to have some takeaways, and this is what we're all dealing with daily. What- well, here's the reality. So I just tell you how God speaks. There's a summary verse that I refer to in every book that I write. It's actually not used to talk about how God speaks, but I do believe it's central. It's mm-hmm. Romans 14, 17, and it says this, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That means to experience the Spirit is to receive those three identity marks. Mm-hmm. Righteousness is a sweet walk with Jesus. Peace is internal serenity. Joy is internal celebration despite the situation that you're in. When one of those gets jarred, watch out. Actually, when all three rise and you sense profound goodness, 
So if your walk with Jesus is focused and your peace mm-hmm. is profound and your joy is increasing, you're doing exactly as Jesus wants you. If your righteousness gets distracted, something's wrong. Pay attention to that. That's God talking. If your peace diminishes, pay attention to that. Something's wrong. Mm-hmm. That's God talking. If your joy disappears, that's a signal. Pay attention. God talking. If all three get crushed, something's wrong. Get out of the room. You're about to be an idiot. <laughs> So what I teach in the book, and I'm giving you a very, very, very fast, like 30 second summary, is you pay attention to the increase or the withdrawing of his presence. And as you do, he guides. Okay. That's a fast answer to a very complex question because temptation is much well, more. It's a, it's a good answer. And it's, it's the, the uh, nature of podcasting that we need fast answers with the goal of inspiring people to want to know more. Yep. And toward that end, uh, let's talk about your new book, Healing Prayer, God's yep. Idea for Restoring Body, Mind, and Spirit, which you co-authored with Maxie Dunham. Yep. What was the inspiration to write it and what can readers expect to gain by reading? Well, the inspiration was all the healing stories I just told you, together with many, many, many more. Mm-hmm. I just think it's supposed to be ordinary. Uh, when I went to Uganda, I watched 30 people get healed in two hours. It was just this, and it, some of them were spectacular spectacular healings. I mean, just, just absolute, a paralyzed lady sitting on a board. I watched a fly crawl up into her eye and take a drink where her eyelash, her eyeball didn't work. She couldn't open and close her eyelid. Mm-hmm. And then the evangelist who was preaching walked over and said, the healing anointing zombie touched her hand and went back to the platform. And suddenly her body began to move. And within 15 minutes, that lady went from totally paralyzed. And I I'd, I'd watched her paralyzed for three hours without even a muscle to mm-hmm. running across the field. It was this incredible. Man. Wow. So, I mean, here's the reality. I did not have a clue about how to pray for healing, nor had I met people who knew what it was to be healed. Mm-hmm. And I had not met people who could train us. And I, I'm concerned because I believe it's central to gospel proclamation. It's central to what it means to be a believer. If you don't declare that the Lord is the healer, you're, you've cut out most of the New Testament. If you don't declare that Jesus has power over the powers, you've cut out, I just said this to you. You've thrown out Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you've thrown out John, and you've thrown out Acts of the Apostles, and you've thrown out Paul because he had a thorn in the flesh sent from Satan. You've thrown out the whole Bible if you don't do this. Right. So the, the recognition of God's miraculous intervention is dynamically central to everything that is attached to the ministry of the gospel. And when I went to seminary, I went to four of them. Not one, not one taught me how to teach prayer for healing. And so this is there's something wrong here. There's some wrong. Right. And we need to need to fill that gap. So Maxie, Maxie was the president of Asbury Theological Center. And he became a great friend by divine appointment. I met him over the miles. It was the most amazing thing. He's good 30 years my, my senior. And the, I was Canadian. He was American. I was in the North. He was in the South. And mm-hmm. we met because God set it up. And that's a long story that would take another podcast. <laughs> but, but he and I are both concerned that the average Christian is unaware that God can use them to bring miraculous healing to people. And they don't believe they're worthy or good enough or whatever, and that's a moot point. It doesn't matter. So what we did was we designed it to be a training manual, and here's the, and we put stories in it about, about miraculous healing. So mm-hmm. on Monday, next week, I'm flying down to Jackson, Mississippi. I'm recording 15 videos to give a teaching for 10 minutes so that people can purchase the videos and the book and train their churches on how to do, how to enter into prayer for healing and not to do you know some of these crazy things that you see happening all across where people don't have enough education or they haven't researched it well they grab onto a corner of a truth because it worked for them and they apply it to everybody no 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 you have to be more pervasive even the fact that we talked about naming the syrian versus the you know the lepers who walk versus the instant heal with leper that's three lepers all Mm -hmm. three different pathways to him so i want people to recognize that there is that God wants it done and his desire for us to do it is even more profound than our desire to understand. But it needs to become part of church culture and not yes. that's what it needs to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. David Chatka, for sharing your faith and theology with us today. How can listeners connect with you online, uh, learn more about the book and the videos? Oh, it's very easy. So, so go to spiritequip.com. Because my, my ministry equips people in spiritual disciplines. So mm-hmm. the name is Spirit like Holy Spirit and Equip mm-hmm. like Equipment. Put the two together. David 
uh, sorry, www.spiritequip.com. And there's access to my Twitter account, my Facebook page, my, my Instagram account, my, my YouTube channel, and so on. I do weekly sermons. And in fact, I'm going to record four of them this afternoon. I do weekly sermons and they're broadcast locally and then they're put onto my YouTube channel. So if you want to listen to my preaching, you can do that. If you want to invite me for a conference, there's a fill out form there. Conferences and events are put on the website and there's also something where I teach Zoom classes and uh, do that uh, in, in a fee for service kind of basis. And that's how I make my living. So right. www.spiritequip.com, that's my handle. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you want to reach me directly, you can go david at spiritequip.com and it'll get to Outstanding. And we'll certainly drop those that drop that information in the show notes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's been a delight to be with you. And thank you listeners for your time and support of this indie business. Remember to like, subscribe, and share for more like this. And please visit my website at drmoanderson.com to book me as a speaker or speaker coach. Subscribe to my newsletter and learn more about my best-selling books. Until next time, be safe and be well. And wasn't that a great program? Oh, love that episode. I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share. Learn more about me on my website, drmoanderson.com. That's M-O-E. You can read book excerpts, watch videos, learn about my services that I offer, and book me for a speaking engagement. I'd love to talk with your group, and I'd love to work with you. So until the next time, review, renew, and reu. Thank you.